So how long have you been riding Palm Tran? It's about six years. I've been riding Palm Tran since I was... Just your geography and the number of your district, please. Uh, that would make it much quicker. I'll start. Senator Tina Polsky, uh, District 30. Uh, in Palm Beach County, I have Southern Boca Raton, and then the rest of my district is in Broward. Senator Berman. Senator Lori Berman, District 26. Boca, parts of Boca, Delray, Boynton, Wellington, and South Bay, and um, Belle Glade. Thank you. Uh, next, please, uh, Senator Powell. No. Good morning. Oh, I'm sorry to it's see okay. you, Representative Edmonds. Welcome. Morning, everybody. My name is Javante Edmonds. I represent District 88, Lake Park, part of Palm Beach Gardens, mostly West Palm Beach, Riviera Beach, and a slither of Royal Palm Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Powell. State Senator Bobby Powell, Jr., representing Senate District 24 from Palm Beach Gardens all the way down to Lantana. Excited to be here. Remember this, a life of service is a life that counts. Uh, we'll skip over Senator Caruso, uh, excuse me, Representative Caruso, uh, Vice Chair Harrell. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I uh, represent District 31, which you are currently in, and that includes uh, lots of towns, uh, Tequesta, Jupiter, Juno, Palm Beach Gardens, Royal Palm, Loxahatchee Groves, Pahokee, Jupiter Farms, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Skidmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, good morning. I forgot what time it is. Uh, I'm Kelly Skidmore. I represent District 92, which is western portions of Boca Raton, Delray Beach, and Boynton. Thank you, Rep. Casello. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Joe Casello. I represent District 90, which includes the great cities of Boynton Beach and Delray Beach. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Gossett Seidman, your location, please. Yes, thank you. I'm Peggy Gossett Seidman, District 91, Boca Raton, Highland Beach, and southwestern Palm Beach County, a little portion there. Thank you. And finally, Representative Roth. Hey. Good morning, everyone. I'm Representative <laughs> Roth, District 94. Uh, I have the largest district in Palm Beach County. My northern boundary is the Martin County line, west of the Turnpike, all the way down to Southern Boulevard, uh, out yeah. to uh, 20 Mile Bend yeah. in Arden, then all the way out to the Glades, including Bell Glade, South Bay, and Pahokee. My western boundary is the Henry County line, and west of 20 Mile Bend, my southern boundary is the Broward County line. So welcome, and I do have uh, my my aide, uh, William Ponsolt, please stand out. And Terry Mitzi was in the crowd a minute ago. Where's Terry? Um, okay, so Terry Rep Mitzi is my, is my aide in, in the Glades. Thank you. Uh, th I'm sorry, I skipped over Representative Waldron. My apologies. No problem. Last but certainly not least, uh, Representative uh, Catherine Waldron. I'm in District 93, which is uh, Green Acres, most of Green Acres. Wellington and Western Lake Park. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Welcome School Board Chairman Frank Barbieri, School Superintendent Burke, and the school board members. I'm gonna ask uh, Chairman Barbieri if you have any welcoming comments before you have your school members introduce themselves. Well, I just wanna thank the legislative delegation for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, you've been a great help. Most of you have been a great help for us <laughs> <laughs> up in Tallahassee. So we appreciate the, all that you have done to help us get our, uh, our job done to, to make sure that our children get the best education possible in Florida. Um, and I'd like to have my colleagues introduce themselves. I'll start with Representative, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> board, board Member Ferguson. Yes, definitely Board Member and I Representative. Edwin Ferguson, District 7. My district kind of meanders from Riviera Beach down into the southeast part of Delray. Great to be here. This is Whitfield. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Erica Whitfield. I represent District 4, which is West Palm Beach all the way down to Delray, all of Palm Beach Island, all the way to Military Trail, minus the little section that Mr. Ferguson has in the middle. Vice Chairwoman Brill. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karen Brill. I represent District 3. Think about Delray Alliance and COBRA. I'm the unincorporated school board member with a piece of unincorporated Boca Raton and Lantana and Green Acres. Mrs. Andrews. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcia Andrews, school board member of District 6. I am your Weston representative. Uh, Lake Worth Road, Lantana Road at the Turnpike, going west. A little sliver of West Palm Beach and then as far west as you can go with Wellington, Royal Palm Beach, uh, Loxahatchee, the acreage, West Lake, Canal Point, Belle Glade, Pahokee, and South Bay, as far west as you can go. Thank you. Ms. Ayala. 
Good morning, everyone. Alexandria Ayala representing District 2, which includes Central Palm Beach County, Palm Springs, Green Acres, parts of West Palm Beach, Haverhill, Cloud Lake. Happy to be here today, and thank you all for having this meeting with us. Mrs. McQuinn. Good morning. We happen to be in my home district, District 1, and I moved west to Miss Andrews. I bump into her, and then south to Board Member Ferguson, and so I'm, I am at the Martin County line north to North Lake Boulevard, east of the ocean. Thank right. you. In addition to the honor I have of serving as chairman of this great school board, I represent District 5. My district is pretty easy to figure out. It's a big rectangle. It includes the city of Boca and the unincorporated area west of Boca. I go from the ocean to the Everglades to the Delray Boca line and then down to the Broward Palm Beach County line. So, Excellent. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you, um, Chair Barbieri or Superintendent Burke, uh, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Mike Burke, Superintendent. And as Chairman Barbieri said, we really appreciate this opportunity each year to meet with the delegation before the legislative session to share with you our accomplishments and our priorities for the upcoming session. Uh, you just met our school board. Uh, there's a PowerPoint presentation and there's also a hard copy in your packet if you wish to follow along because we've got limited screen viewing here. Uh, but you just met our board and I would like to congratulate. We had three of our incumbent school board members, uh, Ms. Whitfield, Ms. Brill, and Ms. Andrews that were reelected by a wide margin and uh, enjoyed great community support and I felt like that was a really testament to the job that the school board and the school district is doing that where the community uh, supports us. So congratulations, congratulations to them. And also, I'd like to welcome, you just met uh, Mr. Edwin Ferguson. He's our newest school board member, and he has been elected to District 7. He is, uh, has filled the seat that was vacated by Dr. Deborah Robinson that retired after 22 years of service. So we're a team, the board and I, and uh, I'm going to take you through a few slides and then leave plenty of time for questions. So if we hit the next slide, uh, we like to start out with some fast facts. We are the 10th largest school district in the nation. As you all know, Florida has big school districts because we align with our 67 counties. Uh, our school district was founded in 1909. So we are 114 years old, but we are a healthy, vibrant, spry 114 years old. <laughs> and uh, we continue to change with the times. Uh, we're proud of our graduation rate, 95.9%. Uh, We've continually raised that each year and we hope to do that again. Uh, 66 or two thirds of our schools are rated A or B, and we are working to even you know, get a higher number there. Uh, we operate now 180 schools with just under 23,000 employees, of which 13,000 are teachers. If you look at our total enrollment, including about 22,000 charter schools, it takes you up to uh, about 190,000 kids within Palm Beach County schools, both traditional and charter. And we're proud of, uh, you know, school choice is something that we've embraced in Palm Beach County for many, many, many years. Uh, we have 335 choice or career and technical education programs throughout our school district. And then uh, moving ahead, you know, with the pandemic, uh, next slide please, the legislature and the governor uh, and the DOE, they took a two year hiatus from grading schools and school districts because of the impact of COVID-19 that had on us. And so last school year was, Full accountability was back in play. All schools and districts were graded. Palm Beach County is uh, maintained our rating of A, and we're really proud of this A ranking or A grading. Uh, we are one of only two of the seven large urban districts. Uh, it's Palm Beach and Miami-Dade, and we're one of only 14 A's across the state of the 67 school districts. So we're really proud of this. Uh, we know we're doing good work. We still have work to do. You know, not all of our schools are A, uh, and we still have students that need help to, to get to their full potential, but we are moving in the right direction and we're really proud of this achievement, achievement to maintain the A. It took a lot of work by our principals and teachers and our students to help address that unfinished learning, the learning loss with COVID-19, and then still rally and recover and get back to this A grade. So moving ahead to the next slide, uh, just some more recent accomplishments. Uh, our schools generated over $16 million in school recognition funds. And I wanna thank uh, the governor. You know, initially when the budget was approved by the legislature, there was 12 counties, including Palm Beach, that were excluded from this program because of uh, our mask policies before it became law. Uh, 
but the governor saw fit to include all of the counties, and as a result, our students and teachers are gonna benefit from the $16 million. And that's the most we've ever brought in. That's a sizable chunk, again, and it's tied to our performance, and I'm just really happy we're able to get those dollars into our teachers and into our students. Uh, we implemented the legislature last year. We wanna thank you. You increased the base student allocation in part to help get to a $15 minimum wage. We had that in place July 1st. We were ahead of the deadline uh, by, of October. We got that done first thing in July 1st, and uh, that's helped quite a bit because we had employees, some of our custodians, school food service workers, they were making about $11 an hour before this increase. So that's a sizable, sizable chunk. And then with bus drivers, you know, there's a national shortage of bus drivers. We've gone a step further. We've started, we've raised that starting pay to $20 per hour, and all of our existing drivers that were already at $20 or more we increased them about $5 an hour. So we raised all drivers and we continue to do everything we can to make that job more attractive and recruit and retain our bus drivers. Uh, our board has approved a policy to implement the Parents' Bill of Rights. And we are working through that. We are committed to being fully compliant with the law. We are gonna abide by the law. And we're trying to do that in a manner that continues to make sure that all of our students feel welcome and safe and supported and welcome, uh, nurtured on our campuses. Uh, we opened a brand new school this year, Blue Lake Elementary down in Boca for you in the south end of the county. And that school is off and running. It's a beautiful facility and they're doing great work. Uh, we adopted a new strategic plan uh, that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, we settled, you know, there's a statutory requirement that we either reach an agreement with our teachers each year on the contract or go to impasse if there's no agreement by October 1st. Uh, this year we were able to get that done in September and then we were able to also get most of our other employee groups wrapped up uh, well, you know, in advance of the winter break. So our employee, we're enjoying like good relations right now with our labor, <laughs> with our various employee groups, and uh, we're proud of that. And then the referendum, I'm gonna talk a little bit about more in a minute. If we go to the next slide, as you may be aware, we've had a referendum in place. Uh, back in 2018, we went to the voters for a one mil levy to help us address some critical needs, uh, mainly in the name of safety, mental health, teacher pay and maintaining our fine arts and choice and career technical education programs, music programs, et cetera. Uh, that was passed in, originally in 2018 by a 72% approval rating. Uh, for 2022, it came in at 74% approval, actually stronger. Uh, so we rode that school board wave of our incumbents and uh, it was again, I think a nice testament that the community uh, supports public education here in Palm Beach County. I'd like to take a minute for a quick video on the next slide here just to, uh, that we're sharing to uh, thank the community for their support. I'm a future pilot. Thanks to the voters who supported the 2022 referendum by 74%, the sky's the limit for my dreams. And mine, and every student in the Palm Beach County School District. Approving the referendum is a priceless investment in staff. Thank you voters for supporting teachers. As a school district police officer, it is my job to protect our schools, students, and staff. It is with great appreciation that I'd like to reach out to the voters and say thank you for recognizing school security. Passing the referendum will continue to fund student mental health services. As a school behavior health professional, I know firsthand how much this support means to our students, so thank you. And the continuing referendum also means that about 750 art, music, PE, choice and career technical education programs will stay in place. Strong schools, strong communities. Thank you, Palm Beach County. Uh, moving to the next slide, there's one last thing on the referendum. I think one of the things that's been critical to our success is that the school board had the wisdom to establish independent oversight on all referendums. And that was embedded right in the ballot language. Uh, we've held true to that. We have citizens that serve on these committees. They meet each quarter. They review how every dollar is spent. And we have adhered to our, all of our promises that that's the only way the money gets spent to support those things promised in the ballot. And uh, we've never had an issue. And what's nice is these independent committees, when it was time to go back to the voters, they supported it wholeheartedly and voted that yes, we continue this one mil levy. 
So that's been a really, that's really boosted what we're able to do here in Palm Beach County. Uh, moving ahead, I know security is always top of mind for all of us. And if you'd go to the next slide, please. I just wanna highlight some things we're doing with our school police department uh, over the summer. Let's see, next slide, please. Over the summer, we implemented, well, first let me step back a little further. Last May, we hired a new chief of police and we were really fortunate to land the ideal top candidate, Ms. Sarah Mooney. Uh, many of you may know Ms. Sarah Mooney. She had a long distinguished career with the city of West Palm Beach as their chief, about 27 years with West Palm. And now she is our chief of school police and she's doing an excellent job. Uh, one of the things that we, we put on our plate right away, it was to implement this new system called Centegix, which is a hard panic solution, hard panic button solution. I've got one on me here. Uh, you may have seen it in the media, but what this is is a panic button that every employee has one. They can press this button three times. It can be used for like a, say a medical emergency or something on the campus. If they press it eight times, that means the Calvary's coming. It's dialed into 911. Uh, all the school police, the local law enforcement agencies, everyone converges on the spot. When it's on a school campus, it has a G GPS type capability that you would know exactly what room or where on the campus the signal's coming from and the help is on the way. So we're really excited about this. We feel like that's just another layer of security. And we are able, the board approved it in May. It was a hefty investment, over $2 million to implement the first year, and it's about a million dollars a year to sustain it. But we, between May 15th and the first day of school in August, we had it implemented in all 180 campuses. So we're really proud of that. It took a lot of hard work of our team uh, on all sides of the house. So thanks to the team as well. Uh, we have ongoing projects uh, in our capital budget to continue to harden our campuses. And you're gonna hear in our priorities later, we have had some help with that in recent years with appropriations for school facility issues, you know, the, the bolster campus security. And we welcome that funding, we hope that continues. Uh, we collaborate very closely with our local law enforcement agencies, the sheriff's office, the various municipalities, and uh, Chief Mooney, I give her a lot of credit for that. She has such a, a great reputation of working well with her colleagues across the county and law enforcement that they've been nothing but supportive. Uh, the uh, chip shortage and supply chain shortage is real. I can tell you that we were working to get more police cars and we're excited we were able to locate uh, 60 brand new Ford F-150s that'll be hitting the streets soon with our school district logos on, you know, as we continue to build our department. We have over 220 officers now. We're hiring more. And one of the things that Chief Mooney did I thought was really smart is in order to help retain our officers, sometimes we would lose officers particularly those younger in their career that would leave us to go to the sheriff's office or a municipality uh, because we were on a 10 month calendar that aligned with the school year. And if you're a younger officer trying to support a family, you know, two months of being off work is not necessarily a good thing. You know, it's less money in your pocket. So chief was able to kind of figure out that we needed about 90 officers that we could keep busy year round. We offered those to our uh, employees and we filled 89 of them. Uh, so that was, I think, a good way of saying, you know, hey, if you want to work year round, we have that opportunity for you. Uh, we do have other officers that have joined us, you know, that are relatively young retirees from the first maybe 25 years of service with another agency. So some of them like the 10 month calendar, you know, if they're, if they're in that position in their life where they can uh, afford to get by with a little less salary and spend more time with their family. But now we offer both options. And I think that was a really smart thing to do to help sustain our department into the future. Uh, we utilized the Fort, Fortify Florida app that was created after Stoneman Douglas, and uh, we continue just to work to uh, make sure that our compensation package is attractive to officers. And we've increased the pay considerably in the last couple of years, and we're right on par with the other agencies in Palm Beach County. Uh, moving on, we opened Blue Lake this year. Next year, we got two brand new schools opening, West Boynton Middle School, uh, out in the Western Boynton area, as the name would imply. And then also the next slide, you'll see our new high school. This is the first new high school in Palm Beach County in many years, about 16 years, Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School, which is in the Western Lake Worth area, Lions Road and Lake Worth. And we are now, we'll be working tonight to try to set the boundaries for that school with our boundary committee. But we're really excited. This is gonna be, this is a $105 million state-of-the-art facility. That's, it's gonna be wonderful. And moving ahead, our mission statement. So when I became superintendent a little over a year ago, the board had recently crafted a new mission statement and I felt like it was an excellent one. You know, the mission of the school district of Palm Beach County is to educate, affirm, and inspire each student in the equity embedded school system. So as I went to develop this plan with our team, we said, you know, this, this really guides it. Those are three pillars to educate, affirm, inspire. And we've developed a detailed plan. If we move to the next slide, 
I'll, I'll spare you. I'm not gonna read all the objectives, but what I would like to point out is that this plan was developed getting community and student voice. We spent a lot of time with focus groups, using online tools to try to build consensus across our community about what was important. And then we've crafted objectives. Uh, we've set measures and goals that the school board is gonna hold me to. This is gonna be part of my evaluation. So there's accountability and we're excited about this work. And if we move to the next slide, one of the things that was, I thought I'm most excited about is we really prioritized the student voice when we sat down to craft this plan. We, sat, we had a consultant go out to six high schools across the county and we had focus groups of students and we were deliberate and we told our school principals, don't just send us your student government or your honor society. Send us a good cross section of kids that represent your school in total, you know, from uh, kids of all interests in academic standing. And the uh, consultant, we were deliberate. We didn't allow adults in the room. I wasn't able to be there. We just had a consultant and they had an apprentice that could have passed for a high school student, a very young <laughs> lady that assisted with that process. But we wanted the kids to feel as comfortable as possible to share that information. And then again, our board, this is so important to them, they approved a new policy this year to form a student advisory committee for the first time in our history. So we have just got that committee off the ground and uh, they're gonna be convening routinely and uh, basically helping us navigate issues and bringing us their feedback. And we're really gonna try to prioritize this as we move the district forward in the next five years. It was really telling to hear from the kids firsthand and some of the things that came back. And you'll probably be pleased to hear that many of their priorities align with your own. Uh, financial literacy, the kids didn't always call it financial literacy, but they would say, look, I wanna know how to live when I get out of school. How do I pay my bills? How do I make money? How do I budget? How does that work? You know, How do I manage interests and our credit cards and get loans and all that? So we're really uh, focusing on financial literacy and we had the new statutory requirement to do a, a semester of financial literacy for all the high school kids. So we're gonna build on that. Some of the questions were a little more challenging. You know, show me how learning algebra is gonna help me with my job. You know, so I had to think about it and say, well, okay, if you're going in any of the STEM areas, it's, it's you know, I can make that connection pretty quick. Uh, if you're just a person outside of those areas, you know, hey, doing a budget, any type of planning, you know, even going shopping, you can weave in a little algebra, but the kids are great and they are gonna challenge our thinking for the next uh, five years here. Moving ahead, the other thing we're gonna do to keep getting more input, we've revamped an annual survey that we do, that we send to all parents, students, and teachers. Each survey is unique to that group. And we've, you know, I mentioned that our mission is to educate, affirm, and inspire. These questions are designed to help us tell if we're meeting the mark. You know, do students feel affirmed? Do they feel welcome and safe on campus? Are they inspired? You know, inspire for us means hopefully that something's grabbed their attention, whether it be the arts or music or sports or clubs, something, a career program, something that makes them really wanna to come to school and then see the value of their education and become self-motivated and then educate. You know, we know we have to teach the standards. Uh, we want the kids prepared for both career and college and uh, we wanna know if we're doing a good job with that from their perspective. So that's going on right now, and we're advertising that heavily to make sure we get a good participation rate. Moving to the next slide, I just wanna say that, you know, we mentioned the 335 choice and career programs. We do not create those in a vacuum. We work closely with Career Source of Palm Beach County. They have identified the major sectors of industry that are growing in Palm Beach County, you know, finance, technology, FinTech, health services, a, a wide variety that you can see listed on the page. Uh, we also work closely with the Business Development Board uh, we'll be having an event with them in the next couple of weeks called this, uh, Claim Your Future. And uh, we'll have about 50 business partners, local business partners that'll be on hand with Boost That Up to interact with our high school kids. And they're gonna get some lessons along the way about soft skills. And uh, you know, I get to give a little speech. But anyway, that's a great event. And in our economic council with Ms. Michelle Jacobs and her team, they also uh, weigh in heavily, along with all the chambers from the Hispanic Chamber to Chambers of Commerce, to Black uh, Chamber, we try to get as much input as we can when we're formulating these plans to make sure we want our kids to you know, stay in Palm Beach County after they graduate or come back from college. And we wanna prepare them for the jobs that are gonna be available. And then we focus on the well-paying jobs. So that's been a great collaboration. Moving ahead uh, to the, okay, I guess this is really what you probably came for today, <laughs> our legislative platform. Uh, these are the major topics. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into those topics. Uh, in safety and security on the next slide, 
you know, we are very fortunate. I mentioned that referendum. So we have one officer in every school as required by law, and we do that with the safe schools categorical funds and our general fund operating budget. We use the referendum money to go above and beyond that, to add more officers, to add more, you know, centegics, uh, more equipment. And what would be ideal is if, if the legislature continues to increase that safe schools categorical to more align with all the requirements of the Margie Stoneman Douglas Act. So that, that's one of our requests. Uh, I mentioned the infrastructure early, earlier. You know, we've been getting about $4 million a year for infrastructure projects related to campus hardening. Uh, these are driven, you know, we have to do the, the uh, FSAT reports each year where we assess each school facility and point out the technology needs. I'm sorry, the security needs of, you know, more gates, more locks, more cameras, that type of thing. And that funding then goes directly to some of those, those needs that are identified in that report. So that's a critical thing the legislature's done for us. We'd like to see that continue. And then uh, really we would just also, you know, we are responsible not just for our schools, but also for our charter schools. So we are monitoring our charter schools to make sure that they have a safety officer on campus. And uh, we also wanna make sure that we just have like the ability to monitor and enforce that and make sure that we're working well together. Jump into the next slide under the category of students. Uh, the mental health, uh, mental health, you know, this really began with Stoneman Douglas that there was a need to make sure that we are trying to intervene and identify students in crisis before things escalate to a tragedy. Uh, so that prompted our referendum. So in Palm Beach County, I really feel like we lead the state, if not the country, in what we're able to offer in terms of mental health services. Uh, we have a behavioral uh, health professional on every one of our 180 campuses. We partner with 37 different organizations across Palm Beach County that are mental health agencies that bring co-located therapists to our schools. And then we've added school psychologists, school counselors, social workers, et cetera. So we are also uh, working to comply with the mandate that we have all of our employees trained in uh, youth mental health first aid. But what's great about being in Palm Beach County schools is that as we identify students that may be in need of some counseling, we have those services at the ready. And you know, accessing healthcare can be a challenge for anybody, student, adult, in any state. Uh, so in our schools, I really feel like we're very rich with that support. Uh, and I checked to see how it was being used last year. We had over 30,000 students take advantage of the mental health services. And we had over 3,700 students that had 25 counseling sessions or more. So, if, I mean, if you think about that, that's pretty significant numbers. And you know, coming out of the pandemic, as you probably read, it's not just Palm Beach, but the, the needs of our students in this area, the anxiety, the depression is far greater than it's ever been. So we're really fortunate to have that in place. So what the ask is here is last year, you all saw fit to increase the state categorical by 20 million. You raised it from 120 to 140 million. Uh, if we could keep that trend going, it would be great because uh, again, it would help bring the funding to help better support the need. Moving forward, on the category of teachers, I think we all know there's a national teacher shortage. Uh, I know the, the governor and the legislature has been working on different programs to help with that. This I, I foresee is our biggest challenge in the next several years, because uh, we know that fewer young people are choosing to go into an education college as a career path. So there's some things that we could do to help. Uh, our school board recently approved a new contract with our teachers that allows retirees to come back and we recognize 25 years of experience, up to 25 years. But prior to that, retirees, if they chose to come back, they kind of had to start all over again. They went to the minimum of the salary range. So now we can ask, offer our retirees if they want to come back, we can give them 25 years experience, we can give them our referendum supplement, and they're seeing a salary in the low 70,000, and then when the health insurance, of course, is important to many retirees, particularly those under the age of 65. So the total compensation package is about 92 grand, and we're marketing this. We've mailed this information out to all of our retirees in the last five years or so to try to recruit them back because we just know it's gonna be hard to find teachers. I'm working with FAU on a program that would allow our employees that have a two-year AA degree to kind of fast track them if they're interested in becoming a teacher. But even that fast track takes about two and a half years. And uh, so anything you can do to help along the teacher recruitment lines. One thing we've laid out here is sometimes one of the barriers is if the teachers have retired they have to sit out a year or they forfeit their pension benefits. And they have to sit out at least six months even if they forfeit their benefits. And for most teachers, that's not practical. So if there's any way that we could shorten that and say, hey, look, go ahead and retire and come right back, uh, that might be a big help. Because once they sit home for a year, it's harder to get them to come back. 
<laughs> you know, they start to see that maybe there's another life out there. Uh, but anyway, I think you get the point. Uh, going ahead to the next slide on finance, you know, uh, there was a healthy increase to the base student allocation last year, and that really helped us deal with the $15 minimum wage and the increasing cost of the Florida retirement system. Please look at increasing that again just to help deal with inflation. Uh, you know, as you all read about every day and hear in the news, inflation impacts the school district just like everyone else. Uh, our property insurance is going up about 50% uh, this year, and uh, everything's going up, you know. So anyway, any increase there, uh, it costs more just to provide that same level of service each year. And the BSA is really the vehicle to get more money into the school districts for these type of cost. Uh, I want to thank the legislature and the governor for last year for maintaining the required local effort. That's the primor primary... Uh, I'm sorry, majority of our local tax rate is at RLE. And the uh, legislature sets that as part of the budget each year, as you know. And for many years there, we were rolling it back, uh, which means you, you roll it back because there's an increase in taxable value. And, uh, you know, you can get less, roll it back, you still may get the same money. But if you, you know, if you want to really help fund education and build on it uh, by keeping the RLE the same, we benefit when property values go up. And, uh, Florida is currently 44th in the nation in terms of funding per student. Uh, we were 46, so we've made some headway. We're starting to move in a positive direction, and um, maintaining our RLE is one way to keep that going. Moving ahead to the next slide, uh, just a couple other finance things. We've talked about the referendum a lot here today. We want to, of course, continue to have that vehicle available to us where the voters can make the decision to increase local education funding. Right now, we can only go for four-year increments. Uh, it would be nice if we could go for a longer duration because we have a lot of important programs that are tied to that referendum. And if we could get, you know, a longer duration, it would put people at ease a little bit. Uh, on the capital outlay millage levy, for many years, over, you know, a couple decades, we had two mills of board authority. Back in the Great Recession, that was reduced to 1.5 mills. So we took about a 25% reduction there. So each year we asked, hey, to consider going back to two mills. Uh, this year, on a related note, you're gonna receive uh, the results of a study by OPAGA that took a look at the capital millage levy and they've come forward with some recommendations. And currently, when it comes to capital funding, this is our funding for the traditional schools. And the charter schools are funded through a separate allocation that the state approves through the budget that's driven mainly by PICO dollars. Uh, the OPAGA study recommends revisiting this and potentially sharing some of the 1.5 mil revenue for charter school projects that they def where they can demonstrate a need. And that obviously would only, that could stand to negatively impact our school district. Uh, we, you know, we borrow money to build new schools. We pledge revenue from this 1.5 mil levy over the next 25 years to do that. Uh, and if we were, this is a longstanding funding and formula. So I would just ask you, if you hear anything about OPAGA and the capital millage levy, please kind of look at that with a very discerning view knowing that it could spell trouble for your home district. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, the expansion of the, the scholarship programs, the family empowerment scholarship programs. We now see in Palm Beach County over $70 million that uh, gets kind of redirected that would normally may have come through the FEFP to traditional schools to now fund <coughs> these uh, voucher or scholarship programs. The, I wanna point out that with that family empowerment scholarship, a lot of the students that benefited from that scholarship were sitting in private schools before the advent of that scholarship. So that's why we saw such kind of rapid uh, acceleration and growth right off the bat. But uh, again, that's, that's a concern for us because it does kind of dilute the funding that we have to operate our traditional public schools. And we have a guarantee to our community that we will serve any student that shows up at our doorstep. And we really need funding to make sure we're prepared to do that. Uh, just moving ahead, accountability and assessments were, you know, this is our first year of progress monitoring. So we now test our students three times early in September. We're wrapping up our mid-year assessments now. And then we'll have the first two are for information only. And then we have the big, the third one in the late spring is just like in the past is the one that really drives accountability. So we've got a couple requests here. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term concordance scores, but concordance scores is what allowed students if they, if they struggle on the state assessment test, if they scored well enough on the SAT or ACT, we could substitute that and allow them to graduate. And for the last couple of years, uh, the, the state has delayed raising that bar. 
And the bar gets reset when the standards change. So what we'd like to see is the state consider delaying that one more year because we are just now putting in the new best standards and it's gonna reset again once those standards are fully implemented. So a one year delay might make sense knowing that we're gonna, we've already delayed it a few years and it's, it's gonna change in the near future anyway. But really what that allows us to do is have more kids that have this other alternative to get to graduation. And then the other thing we wanna be able to do is now that we're using the state testing three times a year, those first two informational tests have a lot of value in terms of like diagnostic analytical value to see how our students are doing and make sure that we're trying to tailor our programs and meet their needs that, that we get them prepared for that final assessment in late spring. And so this one's kind of a technical request that the DOE works so that that format of that testing, the data that comes out of that, we're able to integrate into our systems and really benefit and uh, use it for, you know, drill right down to our individual teachers so they can kind of uh, diagnose and look at their kids and adjust instruction as needed. So that's it with accountability. Next big area for us uh, is pre-K. You know, as a state, I think one of our toughest measures to meet is third grade reading. Our district is at 54% proficiency and we're doing okay. We're, we're above the state average, but obviously no one's gonna be satisfied with 54% of our students reading professionally at third, proficiently at third grade. And one of the key ways that we ever hope to really change that dramatically is starting earlier. So we are trying to make the best use of, the, we have a great partnership with Children's Service uh, Coalition, the Early I'm sorry, Council, I believe, the Early Learning Coalition. We're trying to leverage the pre-K programs that are in place, make sure we're in alignment, that we're communicating, working well together. But anything that you could do to expand pre-K uh, for three-year-olds, potentially four-year-olds, that will pay huge dividends for our schools down the road. And then uh, lastly, a, the next slide was a video, but I think I'm gonna skip it in the interest of time. I'm gonna end with a prop, I guess you would call it. Uh, you know, I've been around a while, uh, <laughs> about 33 years. I went back and I looked for, this is the Florida school laws. So the, the, the earliest edition I still had laying around uh, was 2010. Now this, in 2010, we had 818 pages of Florida school laws. And as a relatively young CFO, I could have probably torn this book in half. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But today, there's no doubt that the 2022 edition is 1,315 pages. Wow. So we have grown 497 pages in the last 12 years. So if you think that's like a generation of kids coming through our systems, that's a 60% increase in legislation. And I just share this with you to say, you know, hey, maybe, maybe enough's enough. Or maybe uh, no more law. maybe uh, we can take it easy this year because we have a lot of legislation to implement. Uh, Stoneman Douglas was a major piece of legislation, well needed, and we are fully compliant. Parents' Bill of Rights, I mentioned earlier, we, we're working through that. Uh, but anyway, when you're up there looking at major bills and stuff, you know, brevity is a virtue. And uh, <laughs> thanks for indulging me with that plea. Uh, with that, Senator Polsky, that concludes our presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Anything you want to add, uh, Chair Barbieri? No, I think moment? let's let the legislators questions? Uh, yeah. ask okay. questions. Um, I wanted to just start with a comment. Um, it is so nice to hear all this good news that the great things that this Palm Beach County School District is doing. Uh, for those of us in Tallahassee, especially if we've been around a while, we hear a lot of negativity. Uh, school boards are not respected. Public school districts are not respected. And I... Uh, you know, representing this area have always tried to push back on that because, you know, I personally feel how, what a great job our school district does. So I really appreciate the numbers, the, the data that you've provided, and, um, you know, we will continue to support you and fight for you and, you know, uphold the good work that you're doing because it's just, we're really like in a vacuum there that it's just, it's just constantly bad, bad, bad. We need you know, to get out of the public schools. That's really all we hear. I sat on two education committees for two years in the Senate, and that's really what we felt. And um, I, I still believe this statistic is correct, that 90% of our students are in public schools. And so uh, you know, we need to support public schools, and I'm so proud of the job that you all um, are doing. Uh, so I do have one question that I'd like to start with. This is a... a non-controversial, easygoing question. Um, 
We have heard rumors that the arming teachers may become mandatory. Uh, as we know now, it is a voluntary program that Palm Beach County has opted out of and our teachers cannot be armed. Um, have you heard this? If you have, uh, what do you think it might look like in Palm Beach County? And you know, if you can comment on you know, what you think the, the board or the district would be, would be able to do in that circumstance sure. if you were required to do so. Yes, well, uh, Chief Mooney and myself, we enjoy a good relationship with Sheriff Bradshaw, so we've made sure that those programs are available at this point to charter schools that may be interested to have a school guardian or armed security guard. In Palm Beach County, to date, we've just placed an emphasis on our own school police department, which we're fortunate to have. We're one of only a handful of districts that have that. Uh, but I have been attending you know, meetings with the superintendents and Commissioner Diaz, and uh, one we also had heard from Sheriff Galtieri. And the way it's been explained to me was that kind of that there's some, you know, when people first heard of the school guardian program, they envisioned, you know, you grab a kindergarten teacher and hand him or her a gun. Uh, what I think it's evolved more into, and as the commissioner has explained to me, is this is, you know, being very selective about finding somebody that maybe has the background. The training to become a school guardian is 180 hours. A big part of that is marksmanship, target practice, and I've been told that you know I would not pass it probably because you've got to basically have a, probably a military or you know legal uh, I'm sorry uh, law enforcement background to have that type of skill set. Uh, so where we stand right now, we have not added school guardians, uh, but what we'd like to do is get more information about the program, knowing that it could become maybe a requirement. Uh, Chief Mooney had came up, you know, she had a suggestion that I embraced. And I haven't brought this to the board in a formal capacity yet, but what we think would be valuable to do is to send a cadre, a small cadre of people through the school guardian training, kind of as a pilot to allow us to better evaluate it and see if it may make sense. That if you have, because the way it's really being pitched now is if, you know, we have our, we're not as a replacement for school police officers, but if, you know, you, our high school campuses can be 40 acres. Uh, even if we have two or three officers, that's a lot of acreage to cover. and. You know, is there uh, an assistant principal or a coach with like the namesake of the program, Aaron Feist, that might have that background where that, you know, it might be a handy thing to have in terms of a crisis because what uh, Commissioner Diaz has pointed out, you know, that time is the biggest factor in trying to save lives and mitigate the threat. Uh, so we're gonna be taking a fresh look at that. And I hope to use this, again, kind of experience of maybe sending well, uh, Chief Mooney's working with the sheriff now and his uh, employees to figure out how we might be able to do that pilot and send some people through. And then what I would like to do is I'll be convening a workshop with our board and Chief and I will bring back our findings and see you know, how our board feels about it. Um, and if there may be a, a, a place for that in Palm Beach County Schools. But as of right now, we, we, we stick with our law enforcement officers. Uh, we have partnerships with the sheriff and municipalities uh, where we contract out for additional officers and then we work really big on communication so that each school knows, like that school police officer knows who his, his or her counterparts are in the local municipality and that they're familiar with our campuses and that they can help us in the event of emergency. Thank you so much, Superintendent. I will open it up to my colleagues to ask questions. Vice Chair Harrell. Thank you very much and thank you for what you do, each and every one of you on the school board. I really appreciate it. Uh, my major concern is teachers and having good qualified teachers in our classroom. Our kids, that's the essential element, you know, that student-teacher relationship. And I did a, uh, a local issue, a uh, funding issue last year, Lee, for uh, really to grow teachers, and it dealt only in St. Lucie County. I am looking to expand that. Uh, we did get it funded, but unfortunately it did get vetoed because it wasn't statewide. And what I'd like the, you all to consider is helping me uh, push forward. And what it would do would set up a pilot program whereby uh, two large, two medium, and a small county could participate in at least to, to evaluate if it's effective. And that would be to say, uh, you have paraprofessionals in your classrooms right now. Let's grow our own. Let's take those individuals who are in your classrooms now and fund them to get four-year teaching degrees through, and you already have a program working with FAU. 
and ask our community colleges, state, co state colleges, or you have, your, you have a university here, to uh, underwrite some of that. So with the state put in money, the uh, community, the state college or the university put in some to pay the tuition so that they could, while they are working for you, especially in summers, uh, but also evening classes or virtual classes, that they could get their four-year degree and commit to you that they would then teach in this school district for two years, four years, a variety, and we can work that out. But I would ask for your support in that, and I think this is one way we can actually grow our own so that they, they're already committed to you. Have them, let's make them four-year teachers. We would welcome that. We are doing some of that on our own, but it would be great to have more support. And we're even looking at going back even a step further to our high school students that might be interested in becoming a teacher and putting them on a track where they could work for us in a lesser capacity and then work their way up to teacher. So thank you. Rep Representative Skidmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have just two questions. One is in regard to the youth mental health first aid. Does the school district have its own trainers that are training on mental health first aid, or do you have to go outside for that? Well, we have to go through a state provider to okay. utilize uh, trainers that have been credentialed properly. That are, that's, that's accepted in our state. Uh, so we have a number of trainers. We are, out, we are also contracting for trainers that have this credential. And uh, it's a challenge. We have to have 80% of our workforce trained by June 30th. And with 23,000 employees, uh, you know, that's a lot. So I recently sat through the training. It's six and a half hours. It's excellent training. Uh, but I was in a class where it was really kind of neat to see. We had a good cross-section of our employees, everyone from school food service workers, you know, to paraprofessionals, to teachers, to principals. And, uh, you know, the training, it's really well done. Uh, it's just that it's hard to get 23,000 people through six and a half hours of training. Mm -hmm. So we're working through those logistics. We're taking advantage of Saturdays, uh, you know, teacher work days. Uh, we have an online version where we're paying employees to do it on their own time. And so, but yes, we're getting Great. it done. Thank you. I think it's a ve very valuable program and want to make sure you're able to continue doing it and you have the resources that you need. Um, very much in uh, the same vein as Senator Harrell, uh, Vice Chair Harrell, I I've heard that um, there, there may be an opportunity to have teachers be a part of the federal apprenticeship program and be in classrooms for two years as, apprentice, as apprentices before they um, you know, are full-fledged teachers on their own um, and that federal funding might be available for that. Is that something that you know about? It, have you looked into that? Is that viable for Palm Beach County? The, uh, you know, I think I skipped over, but one of the board's priorities was more apprenticeship programs. Um, I don't have all the details on the federal program, uh, but I, I can get that information back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Casella. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Superintendent Burke, uh, I was happy when you were elected to that board. Uh, I think you're doing a great job. Uh, and to my school board members here, I uh, thank you for your hard work. I know this is not easy. and. Uh, Mr. Barberi, under your leadership, you're doing a great job keeping this together. Uh, I think some of the things that I'm gonna pontificate a little bit versus, and I wouldn't recommend answering some of the questions that I have, but here's, you know, why are teachers leaving? Okay, you open up with that. Why are teachers leaving? Why is it so hard to keep teachers? Now, I'll, I'll give you my personal view on this. Please don't answer, okay? <laughs> the, uh, this school board's becoming more and more partisan. This is, the, this is what Tallahassee wants. It's going to make the school boards partisan, Democrat against Republican. I don't think that's the way it should be. There's talk about term limits. I don't think that should be for school boards. I think you bring a vast wealth of knowledge, of institutional knowledge to school boards. And I don't think that is, and I'm all for term limits, believe me. I'm a big term limit guy, but not for the, our school boards. You know. We, we talk about uh, the parents' rights. You talked about the parents' rights. Uh, the parents' bill of rights. The parents always had rights. But look at 
how I feel from up in Tallahassee. There's a cultural war against public education. I sit on the Education Quality Subcommittee up there, and I can tell you right now, in the early stages of our committee meetings, there's going to be more and more, I don't want to use the word attacks on public education, but there's going to be more attacks on public education. That's just the way it's going. It's the elephant in this room that we talk about. Um, you know, banning books. I, I'm, a, I'm a product of public education. Uh, and I think a lot of us here are probably products of education. But this voucher program, this they call it the scholarship program, every year it grows and grows and grows. It is my belief, Superintendent, that in five to seven years, publication as we see it right today will not exist. It will be definitely a scholarship voucher program. That's where public education is going. There is bills in the legislature right now to break the teachers' unions, okay, with the dues thing. It's the craziness thing. I don't know what the personal vendetta is against public education in Tallahassee. I, I don't know it. But I can assure you there is one. And it's going to be harder and harder for you members of the school boards, for the leadership, for the superintendents, to govern what is best for our students. Look what just happened down in Broward County. Who's ever seen or heard of something like that happening? So I know we're on a fine line here. Um, I can't get fired. I, well, I probably get recalled, but I, I'm going to say this because I, I just get so frustrated up there, Superintendent. I, I really do. And uh, I think that what has been going on in public education, this board has been doing a great job, Mr. Superintendent, under your leadership. And we will. Cont I think this delegation here will support you up there in Tallahassee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, uh, here, here. Well, well said, Representative Waldron. Yeah, I just want to basically what uh, Representative Sella said uh, touch on touch on a lot of the, uh, the the issues. And I just had some questions. Maybe you could help me with because uh, this is my first term here. Um, in terms of book banning, uh, how many books have been banned so far? We really haven't banned any books. Um, we it was a pretty hefty task. We had to review about 2.5 million books last summer, <laughs> but at the end of the day, there's currently there's about 14 books that are impacted. Most of what we needed to do was move books, remove books from classrooms in grades K through three that had, any, had anything any reference to gender identity or sexual orientation, and then within our library, so we have a. Uh, We've sectioned off a portion that's only available to fourth grade or fifth grade. Uh, we had a couple books that we did remove, but it wasn't so much because of the Parents' Bill of Rights, but because we found images that were just not appropriate, okay. like kind of graphical is images. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, there's some books, like there was a book specifically referenced by statute, the 1619 Project, that we're not allowed to instruct on. Mm -hmm. But if a student decides to use that book for a book report on their own, that's fine. So we've spent a lot of time this summer reviewing books and then working with our principals and our teachers to kind of explain, uh, because the legislation, you know, once it's passed and you know, after it's covered in the media, a lot of people jump to conclusions and sometimes you're not sure what the true requirements are. Uh, we've been sorting through that to try to minimize the impact, making sure again that we abide by the law, but that we don't overreact and remove books that were, you know, unnecessarily. Okay. So we have a review process that aligns with the statute, um, and we're working through that now. The big task now is a recent state board rule that it's not, we have to evaluate all the classroom libraries. So each individual library within a teacher's classroom, all those books have to be categorized, evaluated, and then posted on the website so parents know exactly what books are in their kids' classroom. That's quite a task, so uh, that's uh, good for you, I guess, going through that. Um, and then just a couple other questions. What's the average pay in our county for a teacher? So we started. And what is it in the state and in the nation? Just the uh, well, we our starting salary currently now is forty nine thousand one hundred thirty three dollars. Uh, our average pay with the referendum in place is about sixty thousand. Uh, Florida has made great headway with the starting salary, with the governor's effort. You know, to get to forty seven five, we're now beyond that. Uh, last year. We appreciated we got more funding and for the first time it allowed us to start 
addressing the veteran teachers to try to mitigate the salary compression. That's one of our major issues. It's, it's in our priorities. Uh, so let's see, as a state, on, when you look at the average salary, Florida is still in, kind of in the bottom tier. But the, on the beginning salary, they're doing very well. So the priority at this point really shifts to continuing to increase that teacher salary categorical and then giving school districts the flexibility to put those dollars where they're needed most. And right now, that need is with our experienced teachers. Okay. Yeah, I know the compression issue is a big issue. So I've heard a lot it, about it. Yeah, so. it really is. And we've, that's one of the reasons you know, we have that referendum, which hel helps mitigate that to some extent. But it's demoralizing to our teachers when we sit down at the bargaining table and the, you know, when we first implemented that 47,500, uh, that immediately took the new teacher up to a teacher that had you know, eight, yeah. nine, 10 years of experience. Right. Um, last question, I'm, I'm on the Choice and Innovation Education Subcommittee. Um, what, what would you say, and this is kind of probably an umbrella question, but uh, what's, what's been your experience on the impact of choice and charter schools on the public system here in the county? So, you know, we've had charter schools now for a long time, over two decades. Uh, we have about 11% of our students in charter schools. And uh, we're sitting in a charter school here today that's really a, a, a nice exemplar of excellence. Uh, there, there's two schools running here that uh, you know, serve autistic students and they do a great job with it. I had the chance to tour this school. Uh, we work hard to hold our charter schools accountable. They are now part of our referendum, so they also receive those monies. And they're also subject to the same independent oversight as us. So I feel like we've kind of, that process has matured somewhat. And, you know, <clears throat> we would like to still see, you know, since the board is held responsible for charter schools, if something goes wrong, it, it falls on the school board's shoulders. Uh, so we are kind of concerned with there's this growing uh, ability for agencies outside the school board to authorize charters. And that's problematic. I would suggest if, if the state's gonna authorize charter schools on our behalf, then they should assume the oversight and not expect the local board to do that. That's a good point. Uh, the bigger concern at this point, I would say from at least a financial standpoint and from making sure that we protect the uh, integrity of the traditional public schools and our ability to serve any student that needs it in our county is the scholarship programs. Those are growing faster. They're growing exponentially, uh, much faster than charter schools ever grew. And I mentioned earlier, you know, over $70 million in Palm Beach County alone is going to support the Family and Power and Scholarships and the McKay Scholarships. So uh, that, you know, in recent years, we've, in, the legislature has increased the eligibility for those, and, you know, raising the income amount that uh, families can qualify. And if that's to continue, that, that's going to be problematic. And my concern is that, you know, there's currently there's only so many private schools and parochial schools. Right. Uh, you'll probably see more being <laughs> opened with this revenue stream now available. Uh, but that's gonna be limited number of seats for limited number of kids. And I don't want it to be that the public schools become schools of last resort, where what we're left with is the kids that have the most challenges, whether it's you know exceptional student education or just you know high poverty populations, you know, that type of thing. So, that would be the one to keep an eye on because we're seeing that grow really quickly. Okay, thank you very much, it's very helpful. Uh, just before I get to you, Senator Berman, just wanted to follow up on that one. Um, do you have a statistic as to how many children come back to the public school, sometimes midterm, from a voucher school, private school, or a charter school? We've, we've looked at that because we were concerned that maybe uh, students were coming back to us after the FTE survey windows that determined funding. <laughs> so we've analyzed that. What we found is there's kind of this constant ebb and flow, uh, but it's, it kind of washes out. So this, the population of charter school students has been pretty stable in Palm Beach County. It's slowly grown. It's hovered around 20,000 students for several years. And now we're up to about 22, 23,000 students. But um, there's a certain level, I think, of saturation of charter schools that have opened, um, you know, and. We've got a few new ones in the pipeline. We pretty much have, the board has not a lot of, they pretty much have to approve every application that comes their way. Um, you know, we had challenged some of that years ago and we're not successful. That we, you know, ideally at one point we were seeing, we'd launch charter schools to, to serve maybe a niche that we were not addressing, to fill a void. Uh, but that, that criteria didn't really withstand the test of time. Um, but no, I, I don't think it's a, it's a huge number. It kind of balances out. You know, the parents vote with their feet. 
We, we're not, a, you know, afraid of competition. We feel like our schools are the best choice. That's our, our tagline. And we just continue to try to just market what we're doing, the resources we have, the teachers we have. I put our teachers up against any teachers, private or charter, and uh, the programs we're able to offer because we are a large entity. You know, we, we 180 schools, two more coming. Uh, we do have some economies of scale and some resources uh, that I think do make our schools a really attractive option. Thank you, Senator Berman. Thank you, thank you so much. And along those lines, just because a parent just asked me this question and I didn't have a full answer, they said they heard a rumor that their child could not use the McKay Scholarship in public schools anymore, that it had to be a private school. Is that, is there, that's I'm not also, familiar with that. Yeah, I don't believe that's, that's true. That's what I thought also, but I just wanted to confirm. I see my staff um, shaking their head. And yeah, <laughs> well, that's good to know. Um, but unfortunately, those are the rumors that parents are hearing out there. Okay. Um, so I want to go back to the issue of teachers. Like everyone said, we know we have a shortage and what, you know, we're, I know you guys are trying to address it. I know one of the things the state did, and there was a very big news conference, um, was allow veterans to be able to teach and i know we just asked this issue in tallahassee and we were told that there are a total of five to ten teachers statewide who qualified for that program mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering are there any uh veterans who have tried to take advantage in palm beach county we have uh, we recently hired our first and only uh, veteran teacher through that program yeah it actually worked out really well it's a good fit it's a uh the employee had worked with us in different roles before uh, but now he's a teacher. Uh, he had his military service. And you know what that program does is it gives the teachers a five-year temporary certificate. And then during that five years, they want to stay in teaching. They have to go back to school. Uh, but our, this, in this case, our principal was really happy to, uh, to land this teacher. So we've heard that there were four to 500 people statewide who applied and that there's only been five to 10 accepted. Have you had other people apply? And is there, are there shortcomings that you're seeing happening why these people aren't getting more jobs i believe it's you know it's a new program and it is taking time for people to get that credential from the state i'm only aware of the one teacher at river beach prep i see miss rieger agreeing with me so no that's it we just have that one at this point uh, okay. and then just um i wanted to raise a point also um I've been very concerned about the um, FHSAA survey for uh, where they asked the questions about parents about menstrual health, um, as particularly young girls, um, and that it becomes part of their record. So I am pro I'm not going to bring a bill about it, um, but I am going to look for an opportunity to put that as an amendment on something that comes across so that they will only have to turn in the last page where the, the doctor authorizes them to participate in sports. So just wanted to let you know that. Thank you, that aligns, and again, I, I should have mentioned that. That's in our school board priorities, just to reduce it to the third page. Yeah, mm -hmm. I The saw doctor that. signs off, so yeah. thank you. Yeah, so I will be, work, and I sit on the education committee, so I'll work on trying to get that in somewhere this legislative session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Gossett Seidman. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Barbieri, and I wondered, um, following up on it, this is a related FHSAA question possibly, but what um, is the level of, of CPR and concussion training among teachers or coaches, if you're aware of any of that? This has been in the news lately uh, nationwide, and I, I'm just, uh, I'm new to this job, but I wonder where you are with that in the county, if teachers or coaches or or are uh, physical trainers on site at all uh, events and all practices. I just thought we could maybe use an update. Thank you. So all of our coaches are required to have CPR training, to be trained in CPR before they can coach. So that's in place. Um, you know, within our high school sports programs, particularly football, we have athletic trainers available. Um, we are, you know, we are, in some cases, if there's an emergency, we just, we, we call 911. You know, with football games, there may be EMTs that are on site. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're meeting all the requirements. It's, it's limited. I've been getting more questions lately after uh, the Buffalo Bills player was injured. You know, uh, I think that's got all of everyone kind of revisiting things, but uh, you know, we've got limited resources, but we are meeting all the requirements and coaches are trained. So there's at least two coaches that would be on the site that could, could do CPR until we could get more help there. We also enjoy a partnership with our healthcare district where we have a, a school nurse on our campuses. Uh, we recently had a situation that required both the school police and the school nurse to administer CPR. 
and they saved a life in doing so. And we, we have the AED machines throughout our campuses. Um, and then we've also uh, has added the uh, Stop the Bleed kits in all of our schools as well, in case there was any trauma. Thank you, and as a follow-up, do you uh, foresee a need for concussion training or further uh, personnel on site during practices or games of all levels, not just football, but including you know, non-contact sports? You can have falls in track and field, volleyball um, being contact, but you have other sports where just a, a, a little one movement can produce a problem. Just wondered yeah, overall, I know this is a, would be a massive funding issue, but I just wondered of your uh, status currently. Well, there's a lot of requirements already in place, like with the football helmets having to be reconditioned, and that's part of the concussion prevention. Um, but you know, we'll adhere to all the requirements. The, the FHSAA that was referenced earlier helped set those uh, requirements for us. And uh, you know, I know it's sometimes just the conditioning of the helmets is a challenge because the, uh, the the amount of vendors that can do that and there, it is costly. But our schools work hard to make sure we're compliant. Uh, okay, thank you. But thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Representative Roth and then Representative Edmonds, and I'd love to leave a little time for each school member to say something because they've been sitting here so quietly, and I'm sure they have some things to say. So if we can make our final questions quick, that would be appreciated so we can hear from everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have three issues I just want to bring up, and I'm, I'm kind of a – I'd like to hear some uh, additional detail later maybe, maybe talking to the uh, – to uh, Superintendent Burke or, uh, or others. Um, first one that's interesting to me is community. Uh, I'm, I'm a native of Belglade. I, I graduated from Belglade High School in 1970. Uh, part of the problem in the Glades is, is outward migration where people are graduating, going to college and never coming back. And I was very interested in, in your presentation. I thought it was a great PowerPoint presentation talking about trying to, to, to link uh, your school um, programs to your communities. And so I'd love to hear more com uh, conversation about that and what we can do. One of the secrets to the Glades being able to become uh, financially viable as, as cities and, and to be able to provide more services uh, themselves is to, is to have a, a, a tax base and people, and we need people. One of the things we think about today, we didn't think about before, is you have college students that graduate and can't afford to buy a house, so if they can live with mom and still have a job and come back to Palm Beach County, that's all good work. I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, I was, I think there's only maybe three people, Senator Harrell, Senator, Senator Powell, and myself, maybe, that voted on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in 2018. So I'm very much glad the report I heard today, the emphasis on at least trying the guardianship program, uh, hardening of schools, uh, mental health is a big issue we need to hear more about, and I love the fact that you, you showed us your panic button. So I think we're well on the way, or it sounds like we're, we're dealing with some of these issues, but it's, it's nothing more important than school safety. The third thing I will mention, I would love to hear more about the book review process. I thought some of it uh, in the legislation uh, was, you know, a little bit tedious, but it really was trying to put the burden on people that were actually doing, purchasing the books and reviewing the books, that they, they had some accountability and the principal is accountable. So we just wanna hear, you know, did we, did we hit the mark? Did we go too far? Do we need to do something different? Just, we wanna know whether, how you feel about um, the review process. I was glad to hear that you said you only banned 14 books. So, but to me, the issue is, is, be, is having appropriate, um, you know, educational materials in the school. So thank you. Yeah, I guess just, just real quick, there's a couple points I'd like to make. Uh, one of the things that we're prioritizing is with our, I mentioned the choice programs, career programs. We're really fortunate. We have some good partnerships with local businesses. So like Seminole Ridge High School has a construction academy. It's aligned with White's Construction. And that's a great <laughs> partnership. They build a house every year for Habitat for Humanity. Jupiter High has a medical programs and they partner with Jupiter Medical Center. So one of the things we're trying to grow on is for all these programs, if we can match them with a local business, uh, it brings in, you know, we make sure we're teaching what we need, you know, that keeps us current on the industry standards, what the skill sets they need. So we're working to do that in the way of, uh, I guess, choice programs. The uh, security, I appreciate your support. Yeah, we're, that's a top priority of our school board and it's a never ending quest to make schools safer. As Chief Moody's explained to me, you're never really done. You're just always trying to 
improve. Uh, the book review process, I wanna just kind of clarify, we really haven't banned any books. We, we've had to relocate some books. <laughs> we've had to explain that some books may not be used for classroom instruction, but they're available to the students that they wish to read them. And then there was a couple that were appropriate that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, but the, the state board, when they extended that definition of library to the individual teacher classroom libraries, that's a heavy lift for districts across the state. We've got you know roughly 12,000 classrooms. This only applies to the elementary school teachers, but you're still talking you know, 7,500 classrooms or so. So uh, that was the part that really has now required us to put a lot more effort behind it. And it's gonna be some work to maintain it because you think anytime a teacher may have gone to Barnes and Noble and you know, used their teacher lead money or they had a grant maybe that provided some books for them, uh, now there's a process. They gotta get that book approved through their media center, so their media specialist, and then it's gotta get uploaded onto the school website. So there's a little more bureaucracy to navigate. We're working through it. Uh, and again, part of it's just trying not to, you know, some of this legislation, by the time it gets to us, uh, the, the public's concerned that we're like trying to avoid teaching history, or that, you know, these are taboo subjects, and we're trying to sort through that and say, no, this is what, this is what we have to do to abide by the law, and this is what we're gonna continue to do to make sure we support all our students and affirm them and make feel sure they feel welcome on our campuses. Thank you, Representative Edmonds. <laughs> Uh, Superintendent Burke, yes. board members, Dr. Oswald, uh, Mr. Sanchez. I just want to thank all of you for your work. Um, it's not easy getting our students through COVID, being the 10th largest district, and I just want to commend you. So I have a few questions, and I um, also want to let you know about a few pieces of legislation that I will be filing. So my first question is in regards to guidance counselors. Um, most guidance counselors have about 500 to 400 students. That number could be off, but what are we doing to support our guidance counselors and provide training or any funding towards them? The, uh, yeah, we've added more guidance counselors to try to bring that ratio down. Uh, I would, you know, just yesterday I was at a Pahokee High School. Uh, Ms. Whitfield, Ms. Andrews was with me. And so uh, we heard from students that these were students that were really impressive uh, young men, young women. And one of the things they brought to my concern was they felt like they didn't really start thinking about everything it took to apply for college and scholarships until their senior year, and they expressed a need for more guidance support. So I feel like this is something that we need to do more on, like work, work on, because I don't think we're having the impact that we need. Uh, guidance counselors, I'm sure they're, they're busy, uh, but I'm not sure I'm answering your question. We, are, we do a good job with the counselors we have. I think that's an area we could invest more in and then also look at how they're using their time. Uh, guidance counselors have a lot on their plate. And what we have to do is try to make sure, you know, when you're an adult on a school campus, sometimes you get directed to deal with uh, whatever crisis may yeah. erupt or maybe with supervision duties, you know, the bus loop or the cafeteria. And we need to make sure that we kind of safeguard our counseling time so that they can have the broadest reach to impact kids. But I, I can't tell you that we're where we need to be because I've heard firsthand from kids that say, look, I could benefit, I think some schools may be doing a better job than others, right. uh, but you know, it's a lot. These kids need to navigate to prepare themselves and you can't wait till your senior year. You really need to, nowadays, you need to be starting in middle school really to get yourself on the right track. Thank you for that. And the questions I'm asking, I would love to work with you on these issues as well. Um, we have a huge affordable housing crisis in Palm Beach County. We're all aware of that. Um, we're also having a growing homelessness population in our school district. What are we doing to address the homelessness population? Well, we work closely, you know, with the McKinney-Vento federal requirements, we work with our kids to try to avoid, the, you know, minimize the disruption to their lives, uh, where they can stay, if they're homeless, you know, if, the, if they've moved temporarily, we allow them to stay at their home school. Okay. You know, if that's their wish, uh, so we do that. Uh, you know, it's, again, it's a challenging thing. Uh, we support the best we can. Uh, that's probably one of those areas you could benefit from more resources. Uh, on affordable housing, first thing we can do is pay our employees the best wage possible. Because uh, with 23,000 employees, uh, our school board has been uh, vocal with me. We're gonna have a workshop uh, in March, I believe, to tackle and get into this issue of affordable housing. Uh, we're looking at, if there's opportunities maybe where we could help utilize some of our property maybe to be a site for affordable housing. But the reality is, you know, some, such a project may be great, but when you have 23,000 employees, and many of them on the lower echelon of salaries, right. you know, we're gonna be limited in what we can do. 
uh, sort of the best thing we can do is things like the referendum. You know, pay them a wage that gives them a chance to find a place to live, and then, you know, as from an HR perspective, and Ms. Rieger's heavily involved in this. Uh, once we know all the the programs that are available to uh, workers throughout Palm Beach County, make sure we're getting that information to our employees so they can take advantage of it. Thank you for that. Last question. Um, in regards to parents' engagement, is there any incentive to help the PTA or any organizations alike to get parents engaged? These are great questions. Um, we welcome parent engagement. Sometimes it can, can be a challenge. Our schools work hard at this. Uh, our Title I schools have a portion of their Title I funds that are dedicated strictly to, that they must spend on parent engagement activities. Uh, but when you've got families that are working you know, two jobs, three jobs, it's, their time is very valuable and it's hard to sometimes get them engaged. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that's important to us. We, when we did our strategic plan, we reached out. Like I mentioned the SEQ survey that's going out to parents right now. Um, but it's an ongoing effort. And I want to commend you on the, I believe you have a school board app, and I know a lot of parents are utilizing that, so I know you are making efforts. So the two pieces of legislation that I will be filing in regards to education is House Bill 105. It's the Summer Youth Service Program. It's going to require the Department of Education to create a statewide employment hub with school districts and universities and employers so they can have uh, summer internships for our students. I hope you get your support on that. Absolutely. Our second bill is going to be the Save Our Teachers Act. We were basically just going to ask that we increase our teachers' pay to national average of 65000 and I hope I can get the support of all my members and the school district. Thank you. Yeah, you can get all our support. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Representative Crusoe, quickly, please, because I want to give these members more than a minute to say hello to us. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to thank uh, yeah. Chair Barbieri and the board for, for joining us here today and for your presentation, <laughs> Superintendent Burke, uh, this afternoon. I was, I, I've got a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll narrow it down to one for, the, uh, for time's sake. Um, there are new, new laws with regards to Holocaust education, education in the Ocoee Massacre. Um, anti-Semitism and hate crimes based on race. Um, could you just briefly discuss how you've uh, implemented those laws? Yes, so we, um, that's part of our curriculum. We make sure we comply with those laws. Uh, we, with Holocaust Studies, we do a lot of work with uh, outside agencies like Insight and uh, FAU as a Holocaust Center. So we try to just take advantage of the opportunities that are available we're fortunate to be in Palm Beach County because we are, are rich with survivors of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So we try to, whenever possible, uh, and they're very gracious with their time, uh, we get you know, living members of the Holocaust that survived that to come in and meet with our kids and tell their stories. Uh, just last week, we held an anti-Semitism prevention day. It was part of our uh, professional development day that was countywide, open to all teachers. Uh, we held it both in person and virtually. Uh, so it's a priority for us. The, along with all, basically, you know, everything, all, you know, for African American history, Latino studies, all of that, we check all the boxes in terms of those requirements. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Chair Barbieri to introduce, uh, have his members Great. say a few concluding words each. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, one thing that just comes to mind, though, is that every year we run out of time. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything more important to any of you than education. So I think you, you need to give us more time. Uh, we should, this should be a minimum of two, if not three hours. We meet with you once a year. Uh, a lot of my, my colleagues have questions they'd like to ask of you. We don't have the time to do that. Uh, I appreciate the time you take to get to us, but if you're gonna come to us anyway, can we just make it longer? It's up to you to set that, because I've asked in the past, and I'm always told we get an hour and a half. So if the legisl legislators would just tell your people that you'd like to have a longer meeting with the school board, we certainly would appreciate that. I hear you, Mr. Barbier, and you will have as much time as you could give. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll start with, I'll just start with the order that you're sitting and just keep it as brief as possible so we can get through. Hopefully we can run over if I don't get all the way around the table. Mr. Sure, I'll keep okay. it very brief. Um, I think in District 7, you as the state legislature and those um, municipal elected officials who are still in the audience, you can help our students by helping to facilitate and foster relationships between the private sector business community, uh, business owners and the, the schools. A lot of these schools have financial shortfalls for materials and traveling to different areas of Palm Beach County to expose the children to other opportunities that they may not have otherwise been able to, to see. So I would ask that you all 
in the midst of your busy schedule in Tallahassee when you're down here, maybe stop by a school or two, figure out what the principal's respective needs are and help us in regard to establishing those relationships. I think it'll be something that will have uh, very great, great benefits to our students as they move forward. Thank you. Board Member Whitfield. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all being here with us today and I appreciated this conversation. I, I'm really glad to be able to hear from you. Um, I just wanna highlight a couple of items that are of importance to me. Um, both of them actually relate to Senator Harrell. I know I've been in your office in the past talking about um, uh, VPK and so that to me is a huge priority, always has been. I really do think we need a full day of VPK and I think um, one of the issues that we have around keeping those teachers is really focused on they don't get the same benefits that a regular teacher would get. So one of our last priorities is about allowing them to participate in um, the benefit system that we have. So if that, that is something that I think would be um, easily done and actually would have a very large impact on our teachers. The other thing that you mentioned, Senator Harrell, was about um, the uh, potential partnership with the university to develop teachers. I met a woman who worked at UNF, University of North Florida in Duval County, and I was talking to her and she said she had a teacher um, preparing program at UNF and I said oh my goodness send me your teachers and she said I can't I have to give them to the university it's specifically um, from the university sorry to Duval County Schools they had to be transferred there um, as a part of the agreement and I was like well then we need one and so I'd be happy to work with you it sounds like you're on the same page as me so if that's something that you're that you're interested in please please let me know because I, I think it's something that we need to do here um, definitely in order to grow our own teachers and then finally um, the last thing I'll say is just um, for my communities that have been impacted by the legislation of the past um, year. I know you all don't wanna hurt children in the process, but some of the, some of the things that are coming out of Tallahassee have been very um, hurtful to them and it scares our, our families, scares our kids. And so what I'd really just ask is that be cognizant of that as you're making legislation for this upcoming year. These students are valuable parts of our community as well. And I'd very much like um, them to feel that the state of Florida has their best interests at heart. Um, so we did put that as one of our, our items on here and a lot of it was because I, because I asked for it. Um, so not, don't enact any legislation where you're not thinking about um, the concerns of these students. We have mental health issues that range across our, our schools. And one of the things that we have is children um, just very high suicide rates or wanting to commit suicide. And it's not something that I wanna see happen in our school system. So I encourage you to please be as supportive as you can in the state of Florida um, while enacting what you're interested in, but just keep in mind those students. Thank you so much. Vice Chairwoman Brew. Thank you, and I just wanna thank all of you. I just wanna say I look forward to working with all of you again this session. And I just wanna return for one quick moment to the portfolios and concordance scores. Hard to believe, but it was 20 years ago that Governor Jeb Bush um, placed me on the FCAT Blue Ribbon Task Force where we looked for accommodations for students with disabilities on the FCAT. An outgrowth of that after the committee was finished with its work was the ability to have portfolios. At that time, it was to start for our students with disabilities who were able to achieve the standards but really couldn't take the test and pass it. And as we all know, without a high school diploma, it's very hard to get employment, to go to vocational school. It's now expanded. So there are some students that really do have the potential, the ability to go to college, to continue careers, to go to vocational school. It's expanded now beyond just those students with disabilities, but it is so very important. We're not minimizing standards. What we're saying is the, um, the ACT, the SAT, and especially portfolios for our students with disabilities, our students with dyslexia, who may not be able to, to achieve the scores that they need on the test. We need to make sure that these students will always have a future. So I thank you for supporting that. Board Member Andrews. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank this delegation for all that you always do for us. You've always been right on the money. And the money did come home last year for West Technical Education Center CDL program. Absolutely fabulous. I still invite you to come and tour West Technical Education Center. We're looking to be a testing site there. Uh, we have three big tractor trailers. Uh, we're working with a lot of students who are actually graduating, ready to go on the road to do that work. So thank you so much for that. And I would like to say that working with Mrs. Harrell, we've been talking, you know, my history has been in recruiting and retention for it's years with the school district of Palm Beach County. And I've already committed myself to working with you and growing our own teachers as well as international recruiting. 
and Representative Roth, we are from the Glades and we are going to be working closely together as we look at programs and processes to make sure that the Glades is never left behind and that was one of the things that I did when I started working as a school board member many years ago and for our Representative Edmund. Edmund's parental involvement is critical and I'm already working on a project for parental involvement so I look forward to working with you. Thank you for your great work, all that you do. We're just excited that you are our delegation representatives, that you make a difference every single day. Thank you. Board Member Ayal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for this time. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you in, in a couple of months when we go up to Palm Beach County Day. Um, to Representative Edmonds legislation, please let me know how I can help with that. I have said before at these meetings to me getting that teacher pay, the base pay up, is so important that helps with our shortage that is a key resolution and please make sure it helps with compression as well don't just get our top and leave our veterans out to dry so i appreciate you bringing that up and all of the very um well said questions you had today senator berman thank you for covering the item on the medical forms very important that we get that done and i appreciate your advocacy and others who mentioned they would do the same um, in the past a couple of you on the table have called me during session to ask about legislation i offer that to any of you. Um, if you need my cell phone number, I will give it to you. Please ask us as we represent our communities, all seven of us were elected to this board to run the school district of Palm Beach County and that can be hard when the state and the district are not communicating. So our needs, the specific areas that need specific resources and supports, we have those answers and we can find them. So please count on us as a resource as you are looking at legislation, how will it impact the end user, which is our students. Um, so I, I give that to you again. Best of luck in Tallahassee during committee weeks and preparing for session. I look forward to visiting you all in the Capitol. Board Member McQuinn. Adding my thanks to all of you. It's so wonderful. I can feel your support. I think more strongly than I'm now in my sixth year than I have ever felt that you're all really attending to what's important sure. to the education of our students. So thank you for that. I'm going to end our remarks on just an FYI, but something I'm very excited about that is now in our budget, and that is that the North Technical Education Center, because we know we have a South Tech, which is a charter school, and thankfully we have our West Tech up and running and strong. We now are bringing back, I don't remember how many years it's been gone, I didn't even know it was gone before I came on the board. North Technical Education Center is being remodeled and it will welcome our high school students. I, it's in actually Mr. Ferguson's district right off of Gardens, uh, it is on Garden Road in Riviera Beach right off 95. And I think it's opening in August. I'm looking at Mr. Sanchez, August of 2025. Yes, I knew that. So that's an exciting thing that we're gonna be able to offer our students. Thank you. So, so I, uh, the last thing we'd like to do is uh, I asked the, the superintendent if he would introduce his staff. So, and Ms. Ayala is correct. If you're up there and you have questions and you can't get a hold of a school board member, sometimes it's, we just have to go to staff to ask a question that gets you an answer. So if, if you would introduce your staff and then you're all welcome, according to the superintendent, to call his staff in your Tallahassee if you have a question. So, Mr. Superintendent. Yeah, I'd first I'd like to recognize Mr. Jay Boggess. Jay, would you please stand? Jay is our chief of staff. He, he heads the legislative Affairs Department, and uh, we have a great team. We have Ms. Rita Solnet with us there. Rita, could you wave? Uh, we also work with Capital City Consulting, which is Mr. Ron LaFace and Megan Fay. So you'll, you'll be hearing from them in Tallahassee. Uh, we have our Deputy Superintendent, Mr. Ed Tierney. He is our Deputy Superintendent Chief of Schools. Uh, work very closely with him. He's got Dr. Patricia Ardonez, I'm sorry, Ardonez is with him. Uh, she's our Director of Tra School Transformation. Uh, to Mr. Tierney's left, we got our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Heather, Heather Frederick. She had the tough job of replacing me about a year and a half ago. And she's, she's made it look surprisingly easy. Uh, and then, let's see, we got, we got Chief Sarah Mooney back there. Hey, Chief. Uh, we have our Chief of HR, Ms. Erica Rieger. And we've got some of our, uh, I see Mr. T uh, Keith Oswald, our Chief of Equity and Wellness. Little Keith. And then we've got our Legal Eagles led by Ms. Sean Bernard, our general counsel, uh, deputy general counsel, Mr. Blair Littlejohn, and counsel Yolanda Morgan. So did I, and Mr. Oh, uh, 
<laughs> Mr. Joe Sanchez, who we just heard from. Joe's our chief operating officer. I hope you guys know Mr. Sanchez. He was with us for about 11 years, left for the private sector for about eight years. We reeled him back in. And uh, if you want to get a school built or anything built, <laughs> Joe's the guy. He gets it done, he's built quality and quickly. So I hope I introduced our whole team. We might be. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks for being here. We're all available to uh, help in any way we can. Uh, thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate the time and effort that was put into the presentation. And I'm sorry, there probably never would be enough time, even if we scheduled all day. But you, we all know our individual school members for the districts we represent. Um, you know, you all have our numbers. I hope if you don't let us know, let's stay in touch during session. You help us analyze bills that come forward and our doors, I know, speak for all of us, are always open to all of you. Um, and we'll see you in Tallahassee, but please, please stay in touch with us. And um, thank you all so much. And with that, uh, Senator Berman says we adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Yeah.